Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Views of News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad uh, studios. Uh, currently, we'll be talking about something very important and that is about the Pak India relationship and the threats posed by the Indian Armed Forces to Pakistan. This is not the first time that India has threatened Pakistan. They've been threatening us, I would say, post-1947 onwards, uh, even till now. India is a huge country, we do understand, but the sovereignty of Pakistan is equally important for us. Pakistan is a nuclear state with one of the largest armies, and having said that, one of the most important players in the region. We just can't take the dictation of the Indians. And currently, since the government of BJP is in place, the RSS uh, phenomena or the mindset of Hindutva, that's been prevailing all over India. And this is not only for a certain number of extremists out there. I'm talking about the general perception. Problems for the Muslims, problems for the Sikhs, for the Christians, for the Jains, for the Dalits, you name it, and it exists. And actually, it has uh, really risen in the uh, past couple of years also, ever since Modi uh, took charge. Now, again, the Indians are threatening Pakistan, and the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan, has very categorically said, that India is planning for a false flag operation. Now, what exactly is that supposed to mean? Let's see what Khan Saab has said in his tweets. He says, Modi's RSS-inspired doctrine on Indian-occupied Jammu and Kashmir very clear. First, deprive Kashmiris of their right of self-determination by the illegal annexation of an occupied territory. Second, treat them as less than humans by a Three prolonged approach. One, trying to crush them with brute force, inclusive of inhuman weapons like pellet guns against women and children. Number two, imposing an inhuman lockdown, depriving Kashmiris of basic necessities from food to medicines. And number three, by mass arrest of Kashmiris, especially youth, and isolating Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir from the world by cutting all communication links. Khan Saab further said that third, by trying to show Kashmiri's right to struggle for self-determination, guaranteed in the United Nations Security Council resolutions as terrorism being vetted by Pakistan to create opposition for a false uh, flag operation against uh, Pakistan while detracting world attention away from the Indian state terrorism in the Indian occupied uh, Jammu of Kashmir. Now this was tweeted on the uh, 17th and uh, the interesting part is that uh, there is a very, very prominent threat emerging from the Indians. Should we expect something, what they did earlier in Balakot, came in and uh, threw a certain number of bombs in our uh, forest and destroying that, and then went back. And what happened the very next day on the 27th of February, nobody can um, actually forget that. And Pakistan has said that if India does this again, they will be responding in a similar fashion. So to talk about this, we have with us currently Ali uh, Sarwar Nakvi Saab. Uh, Assalamu alaikum Ali Sarwar Nakvi Saab and thank you very much for taking out the time and talking to PTV World. We also have with us Dr. Rifat Hussain Saab who is a senior strategic analyst and an expert in the international relations. Rifat Saab, thank you very much. And, thank you so much. Uh, let, me put, let me put the first question to Ambassador Saab. Ambassador Saab, first of all, sir, uh, almost... Fifteen months ago, what we witnessed uh, was that uh, there were constant threats from the Indian side and alleging Pakistan. And again, what we saw was that there was this so-called uh, a surgical strike in uh, the Balakot region. And right after that, the very next day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, about 20 of the Pakistanis just entered the Indian airspace and taught them a lesson. They could have taught them much better, but since they were very disciplined, so they were within the uh, protocol. Now, sir, first of all, your take regarding the current scenario. Now, this tweet from the Prime Minister of Pakistan cannot be taken in as uh, something uh, which is a surprise. This is something which India has done earlier, and we expect them that they can repeat a similar mistake. Your take, sir. Yeah, fashion uh, good to be on your program. Uh, uh, I, as regards this subject that you are discussing, I think... Uh, this time, we are handling it better. And I'll tell you why. The uh, 
last occasion when this happened, and there have been previous ones before Balakot also, uh, the the Pakistani side just reacted uh, negatively or in uh, uh, sort of rejecting the allegation, condemning the action, etc. But in this case, this time, hopefully it doesn't happen. But if it does, the Prime Minister is on record, as you yourself said, uh, that Pakistan apprehends this kind of action by the Indians, highly irresponsible behavior of uh, undertaking a false flag operation. This, I think, is already a point that has been made and it's well taken. Secondly, if this were to happen, we have to think about the uh, consequences that might result. First, uh, in my mind, is that we should immediately go to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, and remind him that very recently he has given a statement calling upon all nations to abstain from provocative and conflict-oriented or conflict-directed uh, actions which could uh, deflect from global attention in combating the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So, we should go to the Secretary General, point out that we have already alerted the world community about this possibility. And now it is something that we bring to your attention for immediate action. What would that be? That would, in our view, would be to activate the Anmogip and to uh, uh, undertake an investigation. And in that uh, uh, background, we should uh, urge upon the international community, the Security Council, and whatever be it, uh, to, to uh, point out to India that they should not be uh, taking this kind of a steps, uh, which are highly irresponsible and uh, detrimental to the peace and the stability of this region. Now, uh, looking at uh, the recent uh, developments in Balochistan, sir, we know that uh, Ajit Doval has always threatened Pakistan and he says that uh, offensive defense is the best solution and that means that even if there is no threat, still attack. The point is that uh, we have lost a number of soldiers, sir. Recently, a major along with five Jawans were martyred about 15-20 uh, kilometers uh, close to the Iranian border. And then uh, seven per uh, this FC uh, personnel embraced Shahadat as well in two separate incidents. Again, uh, the province was Balochistan. Now we do understand that the Indians, Rifat Saab, they are trying their level best. And they have openly declared that they will do whatever they can in Balochistan to destabilize uh, uh, our country. Now having said that, sir, now this has started... Uh, a lot. I mean, I'm not saying this is going to be an intelligence failure because a lot has been done uh, to, to safeguard and to look after the uh, military personnel of Pakistan. But still, having said that, sir, this is happening time and time again. And at the same time, the threats posed by the Indians, uh, the threat posed by their uh, new defense chief, uh, General Ravid. Now, are we heading towards something which we may call a limited war? or a conflict on the border, or something all along the LOC, or maybe something at a much larger level if they try to intrude the space again. Dr. Rifat Saab? Well, Faisal, uh, I have uh, two things to say on this issue that we are discussing. Please. One is that we should never underestimate the Indian, yet another Indian attempt to stage a false flag operation. And Pakistan has repeatedly uh, warned the international community and, you know, have been putting out statements and the latest statement that you have quoted of our Prime Minister is also to be seen in that context. One. Number two, the Indians are pursuing a two-pronged strategy in which they are, on the one hand, escalating uh, the Balochistan insurgency uh, to put more pressure on the, on the Pakistani forces who are trying to combat this and the recent spike in violation, uh, spike in violence 
in Balochistan, whereby they were within two uh, within two weeks. Uh, last two weeks, there have been uh, you know eight or uh, uh, nine Pakistani soldiers who have been martyred. Uh, is also an indication of that. And as part of the second prong, they want to put pressure on Pakistan to uh, what they have, what they are calling a revived Pakistani uh, network, uh, which uh, uh, which they are trying to blame on Pakistan that Pakistan is trying to revive the uh, or trying to interfere or trying to uh, uh, to uh, stop the fire. Of, counter, of, of terrorism in Kashmir. There's no evidence for that, but you know, they, they in the wake of the Anwada incident, they have blamed uh, the so-called uh, 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 revived group, which has links with uh, Jashi Muhammad, and they have apprehended one or two Pakistani civilians who had nothing to do with uh, with these incidents. They were actually farmers who had in, inadvertently passed into the Indian territory, and yet. Indian media, along with the Indian military uh, spokesperson, they are projecting them as terrorists. So Pakistan should not underestimate the potential for the Indians to launch a false flag operation. However, I hope that better sense would prevail and India would not push Pakistan to the brink because if there is any action of the sort that happened, uh, you know, about uh, of, of uh, Ala Bala Court. So Pakistan will be uh, well within its right to respond to the Indian aggression. But I think the Indians are facing internal difficulties to institute or to put more pressure on the Kashmiris to give up their right to self-determination. And Pakistan's advocacy uh, in all international forums uh, is, is, uh, is having a negative effect on the Indian mindset. And the Indian security forces, there are reports that there have been uh, differences between the Indian police force and the border security forces, and that was the context in which, uh, on on um, uh, uh, May uh, on May 8th, 18th, the Indians had uh, 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 on on May 8th they had called a high-level security meeting in which they were undertaking a review of the situation, and you know now the the Indians are do not know how to handle the Kashmiri resistance, All right. that is frustrating them, and that's putting increased pressure on them to do something uh, uh, untoward uh, uh, towards Pakistan. Now, this is exactly now, let me take the same point to Ambassador Saab. Ambassador Saab, now, <clears throat> if you remember, after the Balakot incident, I mean, the security forces of Pakistan they thought that they, they should retaliate and give a befitting response to the, to the Indians, and which they did. Now, the level of response, the kind of commitment Pakistan had, and the kind of surprise which we gave to them. That is something which is still in their mind. Now, for example, if they commit a similar mistake again, by either sending their jets, <coughs> or maybe through missiles or something, they attack a certain target and say, well, this was a terrorist camp, and you know, see, we blew it up. Now, what sort of a response should they expect? Obviously, they will be guarding their frontiers at a much, much, much higher level uh, because of what earlier has happened. Don't you think that can actually trigger a limited scale war or maybe something beyond the control of both the countries, sir? Well, uh, you know, there are different uh, ways of uh, looking at it. My perception, or uh, the way I would uh, look at this whole thing, is that our response should be befitting, uh, proportionate, and uh, measured. We should not act irresponsibly. Because if the Indians are not aware of the disastrous consequences of uh, this kind of irresponsible behavior, that doesn't mean we should also do the same, uh, take the same line and the same uh, approach. Uh, I think we should but, be but, but what other language will they understand? Fair. Because, sir, we have tried a level best to talk, to negotiate, to try to convince. Uh, even we want to share the intelligence so that we can look into the issues and the matters. But Indians, they, they are stuck. They still cannot accept the existence of Pakistan. That is the most unfortunate part, sir. 
Yes, I mean, recent uh, uh, policy direction of the Indian government is uh, uh, most unhelpful, in fact, uh, very damaging to the overall perspective of uh, regional stability. And I think that is very, very unfortunate because not only does it have very uh, negative repercussions for its relations with Pakistan, it is absolutely tortuous for the minorities in India, especially the Muslim community. So, uh, the Indian government is doing this uh, for its own domestic uh, constituency. Their economic policies have failed. The government of India has not been able to uh, achieve economic success of the kind that they have uh, done in the past. And then to add uh, to add uh, this kind of a, a crisis to a, a further aggravate is the question of the, is the issue of the coronavirus. So all this, you know, India is in a mood of acting irresponsibly, acting belligerently, acting recklessly. So we should we should not fall for this bait. It is a bait of to do. Uh, lead to uh, uncharted territory of total crisis uh, uh, and total disaster. So our measured response would be the kind of response that we gave in Balakot, which was very correct and very effective because we shot down their planes, we got their, captured their pilots, and we, we, we proved that they cannot fool around with us. So, I think we have to uh, look at it the same way again. It depends what happens, Faisal. We, we are all hypothesizing at the moment. I mean, uh, if they are going to take some action, what kind of action they will take? Uh, you talked of, uh, you know, uh, aerial attack, you talked of missiles, you talked of different possibilities. They might even act on, uh, uh, in the sea because they have sea-based uh, capabilities now. So, uh, we don't know, but I, I hope, I hope that the Indian government does not continue on this reckless path, because if it does, uh, it, would, it would lead to a uh, total uh, disaster. Now, the um, a point I made about the uh, diplomatic action uh, still remains valid. And I think on the ground we should leave it to our military planners to work out uh, all kinds all right. of scenarios. Uh, Ambassador, sir, I'll just get back to you on this. Let me let me put this question: the same point which you have raised uh, to Dr. Rifat. Rifat, uh, when we say a proportionate response or or, or or a befitting response, and with all the consequences in mind, now last time, sir, when they came, they intruded, they dropped their bombs or the payload and they rushed back, except for uh, damaging a few uh, trees or maybe a certain area, uh, that is it. And the response was right in front of you. But now, sir, for example, if they do something beyond that level, which most likely, obviously, they, they are also planners, they have an army, they have think tanks there as well. Do you believe that the response, if it is proportionate, uh, would be pretty damaging for South Asia, even their act also. And well, considering the current situation in Afghanistan and this coronavirus which has taken over the world, sir, uh, this issue could lead anywhere because the energies and the focus of the entire globe is towards fighting the corona menace. Well, one Faisal, the common challenge is to fight the coronavirus, but unfortunately, Indians are not willing to cooperate with their regional neighbors, including Pakistan, to come up with a coordinated response to deal with this overarching threat. So, having said that, the Indians are continuing. The Indians are uh, uh, Indians are continuing to play the zero-sum game, and they are looking at Pakistan as the enemy. And I should say this that as part of uh, uh, Trump's new strategy of 18-point containment of China, which was announced recently, uh, and that also 
emphasizes one of the key points in that strategy is to to strengthen the us uh, and india military collaboration now indians could read this uh, this uh, desire on the part of washington to uh, strengthen their military ties uh, with india as a clear indication to teach pakistan a lesson and they have been looking for an excuse so i think uh, the in the post uh, covid 19 environment india could be reading it in terms of their own strategy and and they have been looking for an excuse to to so called punish pakistan for its alleged uh, involvement in uh, in acts of terrorism in kashmir so in that context in that context i think there are there is a certain need that we should not only address our concerns to the un security council but we should immediately bring this to the notice of all the uh, permanent members of the security council including the united states that you know your effort to back up india against china could have disastrous consequences for, for south asian security and as far yeah. as your your concern whether we should uh, uh, whether we should have a proportional response or a measured response or you know a a, a, a a befitting response i think pakistan should make it absolutely clear to the indian that any act of aggression on the part of either indian air force or the indian military under the false flag operation will will lead to unpredictable response from pakistan and pakistan should not specify you know what uh, the manner in which we are going to respond but we should return we should uh, tell the indians we retain the right to self defense and that includes uh, you know uh, a resort to force if war is imposed on pakistan now rifat sahab two important developments <clears throat> one is about the recent attack by the freedom fighters on the indian uh, military forces killing one colonel one major and couple of jawans and obviously we do understand that the armed struggle has started there number one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. number two sir the latest statement of uh, abbas tanakzai regarding the indians do yes. you think at some stage the taliban and the kashmiri uh, freedom fight or the struggle for Uh, freedom i mean they can join hands because at the end of the day when you talking about jihad you talking about the muslim umma and the suppression and whatever torture the kashmiris are going through what if the taliban they start looking towards that side sir again pakistan will be blamed for that what well, the indian indians would obviously blame uh, pakistan for that because in their perception uh, pakistan support for the for the taliban uh, and uh, is is a part of the Uh, uh, what they call the pakistan proxy war against against india but you know on their own uh, if the taliban are willing to to lend a moral and military uh, and material help to the kashmiri cause so pakistan should not be standing in their way because uh, kashmiri is a struggle is as just as the uh, as is the afghan the struggle for their uh, for their freedom so uh, so pakistan uh, cannot be indians would would like to pin the blame on pakistan because they look at the kashmiri struggle as well as the afghan struggle for freedom as as pakistan driven but you know we should let the we should come up very clearly and we should let the international community know that pakistan has nothing to do with it pakistan is only uh, trying to encourage the afghan led uh, afghan own peace process and in that pakistan has been urging the the afghan government to sit down with the uh, with the uh, with the government in kabul to initiate the intra afghan dialogue uh, so we should try to rebut this indian effort to portray uh, kashmiri struggle and and also the afghan struggle in the uh, as something which is driven from pakistan all right thank you very much dr rifat saab uh, for your participation in the show now uh, ambassador saab there are two points again one is regarding the current scenario in afghanistan because it seems that the role of the indians that's been minimized even uh, when asked that uh, because pakistan has supported the dialogue between the taliban and the indian uh, establishment but primarily what we saying or and what we are seeing at the same time is that uh, there seems to be a disconnect there seems to be a lot of uh, i would say trust deficit between the taliban and the indian forces and the kind of statement which we heard from sanak zai also tells a lot now 
looking at this current situation, sir, uh, earlier I uh, was having the uh, same <coughs> uh, discussion with um, uh, the uh, Doc Sub. Uh, now, Doc Sub says uh, that depends. Let's see how it moves forward. Uh, but Indians will blame Pakistan. Now, things where we do not even have control, sir. Don't you think that uh, uh, organizations, because you always talk about United Nations, it seems uh, Mr. Antonio Gonzalez was in Pakistan for about a week long. He has been to almost all the places. He did understand what exactly is going through our minds. But still much hasn't been done. Issuing a statement doesn't make any difference. We do understand how United Nations and the rest of these organizations work. And now even it's more clear that the countries which are funding them, they can get the max maximum benefit. Just like uh, as if my father is funding Harvard University, so I'm going to be the champion there. See? Your take. Yeah, Faisal, I mean, these are, these are questions that, uh, of course, uh, come to one's mind. But the reality of the situation, like, you know, if you expect Indians to be fair in looking at Pakistan and uh, Taliban uh, relations and uh, to think that pa Pakistan is not involved with uh, the Taliban, they, they, they are most uh, unlikely to... To look at it that way, they are going to use this. You see, the Indians will use it against Pakistan as they use all the other arguments. So, uh, the, nothing is fair. Now, as for the UN, Guterres uh, knows Pakistan. You are quite right. He knows Pakistan better than, uh, you know, Ban Ki-moon, who was the, his predecessor. But the point is that how far he can go. He is, uh, a, you know, he is not a, an independent player. He is in the hands of the big powers of the permanent members of the Security Council. Our, my point is that we have to nevertheless work with the, this organization because it gains us a propaganda advantage. It gain, gains us a narrative advantage. We uh, can uh, tell the international community that we have... Uh, been pursuing with the UN the the uh, question of uh, uh, crisis uh, management in this region, the question of strategic stability in this region, uh, and we need the help of the international community. You see, basically, uh, we are the weaker party. We are smaller in size and population. We have a, a smaller military force, though this is all relative. We, our military force is a big force, but it's relatively smaller than India's. So we have to mobilize support uh, internationally and outside Pakistan to deal with this situation. We don't need support in in in. Uh, military terms, we don't need to uh, go to anybody, thank God. But we also need to get a better uh, understanding of our case uh, in acceptance of our narrative, of our position. And there I think the UN comes in. So we, we have to... Uh, work on all these fronts, Faisal. And it's but, but, not but, going but to be easy. Uh, never, sorry to never differ be a little. Easy. It's been 70 years. Uh, Pakistan had two parts. East Pakistan, West Pakistan. We lost even the East Pakistan. Obviously, that was so damaging, whether it was a political blunder or whatever it was. Then moving on, sir, Kashmir issue. When you talk about Kashmir, sir, recently we, we had a show even on the, on the topic that I was uh, sent by someone a clip of the Indian news in which they were talking about the weather. And can you imagine, they were talking about Muzaffarabad and they were talking about Gilgit Baltistan and this was the domestic uh, uh, feature, sir, not the international weather. Yeah, this, is, this, this is their so, latest so, And then part. when they, yeah. they add this part in their own, uh, even their curriculum, sir, forget about uh, the general mapping, I'm talking about the curriculum also. What is that supposed to mean? That means that they are actually eyeing at it. They really want to take it from Pakistan. They will be successful in sabotaging CPAC just in case. They will be able to uh, 
you know, sort of maneuver whatever they, they plan to, just in case. So, that area is of critical importance. Maybe our, our attentions are diverted towards Balochistan or maybe Karachi or elsewhere, or maybe on Corona these days. But the, I would say, the clever enemy has a very, very destructive design, sir. Yeah, that's right. I mean, these are, uh, you know, th this weather, uh, 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 the weather uh, forecast for uh, this region and for the specific areas in uh, Azad Kashmir, uh, this is a ploy for their domestic audience. You see, as they can't do very much, and I told you that economically they have had a lot of uh, failures and uh, uh, the, the, they have not been able to move forward. Uh, they, they have to appease their domestic constituencies and this is what they have resorted to, which is irresponsible, which is bad, highly reprehensible, but it is something that is there and we have to deal with it. Now, 70 years, yes, for 70 years, you know, we have, uh, we have been, Kashmir has been a victim of the Cold War whenever resolutions used to be brought up in the Security Council, the Russians used the Soviet Union at that time used to veto those resolutions. So, uh, like, likewise for Palestine, I mean, both these two issues have also been a victim of the Cold War and all the maneuverings of the Cold War which resulted in uh, a failure to uh, allow these people to come up. Now, now, in this present scenario, the Indians are doing all these things, but we should ignore it. Like Article, uh, I personally feel, Article 370 and Article uh, uh, 35A, uh, these, we never recognize them. That, that's part of Indian legislation. That is not uh, rec uh, internationally recognized legislation. So, whether they keep it or they remove it is irrelevant. We, we, we need but not the, they are about doing it. everything. Kashmir is in uh, Whatever is in their control. Sir, uh, I'll just get back to you, sir. We've also been joined in uh, by Director uh, Sasi, um, Dr. Maria Sultan. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Maria. Assalamu alaikum, you. Uh, hope all is good at your end. Your quarantine is going well. Well, hopefully, yes. And thank you so much for asking. Good. Now, talking about the current scenario, the tweets of uh, the Prime Minister expecting. Uh, a false flag operation by the Indians, which we have earlier witnessed also, and then that 15-month-old uh, story in which we retaliated and whatever happened, the whole globe knows about it. Maria, do you fear, or rather I should not be using this word fear, do you believe that the Indians, A, they have the potential uh, to carry out such a flag operation once again, or if they do, should we expect a similar I would say a proportionate, a befitting response by the Pakistani Armed Forces or the Air Force for that matter? Uh, first of all, we need to understand that at this moment the Indian government finds itself in a very precarious position. And the precarious position is that despite the fact that uh, they have imprisoned the people of Kashmir uh, in the Indian occupied Kashmir, uh, they have unable, uh, they remain unable to contain the situation on the ground. Furthermore, uh, their idea was that by instilling and removing Article 35A and our, um, Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, they would be able to uh, bring in a new population into that area. So they're continuing with that plan. But the problem lies here within, and the problem is that the people of Kashmir, in the Indian occupied Kashmir, um, do not seem restive with the Indian plans, number one. Number two, situation is out of control. Number three, the global opinion on that uh, does not sway with the Indian opinion. And given these situations, um, the, given this situation, they are most likely um, to carry out uh, an operation into Pakistani territory. The question is not whether they have the ability or not. Of course, this is an army which is three times more than us. It is having an Air Force five times more than us in terms of strength and power and, and a Navy almost seven to one. And furthermore, they think that they're important because of the different alliances which they have got with Western powers. But the problem is never in, uh, in the ability of a nation to carry out a preemptive or any kind of an operational strike on the other side. The problem lies what happened on 26. That is the response which is going to follow after. 
So we do not uh, think that uh, in terms of threat uh, that India is going to change its course. Uh, they are determined because the situation in Kashmir is going out of hand, especially in the Indian occupied Kashmir. Number two, militarily they can take an action. But here is where the challenge is for the international community, for Kashmiris, especially um, in the Indian occupied Kashmir and last but not least uh, for India. And that is that once Pakistan responds back, uh, will India be really ready to deal with a mass uprising which will happen in Kashmir? And in that case, if the people of Kashmir come out in the Indian occupied Kashmir, uh, what will follow through? Are they ready to let go of the situation uh, in Kashmir? And maybe they will face something what we had faced in But Maria, Maria, listen, uh, the, way, the way things are progressing, I'll just give you a few examples because you can, you can see the dots and you can tell the direction then. Uh, for example, including uh, the map of Gilgit Baltistan and Kashmir, reporting it in their uh, weather update, uh, then again deploying a lot of forces, new uh, weaponry out there, and using it even on the line of control, and then threatening Pakistan. I mean, lately there was this uh, uh, general who, in fact, threatened Pakistan that we'll take it away and we'll see what they can do. I mean, Gilgit, Baltistan, and, and uh, the area, the, which is the, uh, which we call Azad Kashmir, uh, do you believe that it has a potential threat that Indians, you never know. Look at the way they're increasing their military capability. Uh, look at the way they are purchasing uh, the jets from left, right, and center. Today I was reading that there are uh, 124 separate jets, other than the Rafales, and then induction of the Tejas, and upgradation of a lot of other jets as well. Now, that tells us the story. They're not deployed towards China. Primarily, they're looking, looking uh, towards the Western side, towards us. I yes, mean, you're right. You're spot on your analysis. The fact yeah, that, that India has to uh, address Kashmir in order for them to be seen as a regional or a superpower. But like I said earlier, the challenge is that, that they still do not contain and control uh, the Kashmiris in the Indian occupied Kashmir. Secondly, if they plan on attacking Gilgit Baltistan, Azad Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan in those areas, yes, they can attack us. But will that anger over there? Will it be a limited war? No. Uh, India has the right to attack. We have never debated that. But we have the right to respond. And once we respond back, uh, this is not going to be a small response, a calibrated response on what we saw in 26. It will be a response of our choosing. Now, here is the question which the Modi government really needs to answer, not only to its own people, but also to the international community, that are they willing uh, to lose uh, whatever they think is left of the Indian economy and Indian government's ability to sustain the situation on the ground if they go into another war with Pakistan? Number one. Ma'am, so now two, the wars, they lead to absolute destruction of the economy. Well, that is but true, looking at the current scenario, don't you think this is really a conducive environment to, to, to start well, a war? The thing is, there is no conducive environment to start a war. But if I you mean, this corona, man, which is already, you know, we all know what yes. it has done to major yeah, economies. And not only to their economy, there have also been reports that the Indian Army has been suffering from a very high rate of corona itself. And there have been lots of casualties in the Indian Army, especially in the southern sector. But that said, the fact of the matter is, is that that's what I'm trying to say, that if they think that they can rely on these precision-guided technologies and carry out any kind of a preemptive strike on Pakistan, Pakistan has said it very clearly in terms of actions, in terms of work, and in terms of the determination of the nation, that we will fight back. So if they come in Kashmir and they think that this is some, point, some kind of a swift operation which the media can just by putting Azad Yaman, Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan weather engine report is just going to change the reality on the ground, no it won't. The fact is that the Indian occupied Kashmir uh, is Indian occupied. It is a part of Pakistan and Pakistan firmly believes that the people of Kashmir belong to Pakistan. This is unfinished part of partition and it will go there. So if they go for any kind of uh, any kind of precision oriented strike, the response will not be so uh, limited. This is one thing they have to think. Number two, uh, the consequences of an India-Pakistan war have never been great. You know, there has never been something which has been painted out in any kind of analysis as something which is going to stop at the level of desired intent. So given this, um, I think the challenge is quite huge, and they should not miscalculate Pakistan's ability to respond back or, or determination uh, to respond back. Because rest assured, we have shown immense results 
we have waited for international community to come to the help of the people of Kashmir, but they haven't in Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, the tyranny and the violence which they're subjected to goes on unchecked. So if it continues, things go out uh, and happen on ground in the military domain, then I think uh, the situation will be quite different on ground. It will be a repeat of 1971, but this time we will have a lot Jammu and Kashmir to be expanded to have the entire control of Kashmir, which includes Indian occupied Kashmir. All right. Uh, uh, Ali Sabah Nafi Sahib, there was a statement of uh, the AJK President Sardar Masood Khan Sahib, and he says that uh, there is a very high possibility of an attack on even Azad uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And we have alerted the forces and everything, but we cannot rule out uh, the, the reality that the Indians, they have been saying it uh, very openly, whether it's, it's about their uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi or their Defence Minister or the uh, National Security Advisor, uh, for that matter, Mr. Ajit Doval. Uh, now he says that uh, the intelligence chief and the military heads, uh, they have all met, and the, even the National Security Advisor, they have recently met, and there's something brewing out there. Do you think something is possible around Eid or something like that, sir? Well, I think uh, there is always this danger and we have uh, faced such threats and uh, such such uh, impending uh, uh, looming threats on our uh, on us. But, you see, I'll say a few things. In the first place, there used to be from India many declarations that they are going to uh, attack uh, uh, Muritke or they are going to attack uh, uh, some place in Bhavalpur uh, uh, to uh, 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 kill the, or wipe out uh, terrorist hideouts, militant groups which are uh, based in these areas and things like that. Similarly, what Masood Khan has said is, I think, valid. Uh, they have been making these uh, threats against Azad Kashmir territory as well. Uh, to be taken seriously. In the first place, Azad Kashmir issue is uh, something that the Indians are trying to play up. And uh, it is quite likely that they will, uh, they will do something. But we should not forget that we are very well prepared. We are prepared to deal with it. Our military forces have worked out all the possibilities that uh, uh, that may shape up. And the response will be such that they will they will not know what what to do next. Because we proved it in Balakot and we proved it uh, in February uh, of that year that the, the uh, Pakistani side will will hit back and hit back uh, in such a manner. Uh, Ambassador, that they will la last quick, quick comment because we are totally running out of time, and that is again uh, about a few months ago. Uh, David Cameron, I'm sure you know uh, that he was here in Pakistan, the former ambassador yes. of the United States of America. So I, I was interviewing him. And you know, whatever he said Cam during... Cameron, uh, sorry, Professor Cameron Munter. Yeah, Cameron, not David Cameron, sorry, Cameron Munter. My mistake, sir. Uh, yeah. Now, what he said that there is a very high probability, and this is coming from one of the best ambassadors who has served in Pakistan. Very upright, very honest, very straightforward. And he said there could be multiple reasons. I mean, this is one reason, but he said it could be, uh, it could be water issue. It could be something related to that. Uh, because when it comes to food security or water security, I mean, you know, it's, it's equally threatening. But he was of that point of view that there is a very high probability. I mean, what I'm saying is that even people sitting in think tanks, uh, observing the situation, and uh, who has already served in Pakistan and the region also, they are also thinking on those lines. Yes, I mean, this has been uh, the topic uh, of... Uh, analysis and concern that has been uh, coming up in American think tanks, in British think tanks uh, for some years now. Uh, the, the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, the Institute of Peace and all uh, forums uh, like that, Brookings and Carnegie, uh, have been talking about the possibility of a uh, 
terrorist attack and a uh, consequent conflict between India and Pakistan and uh, so forth. Now, all these things are there. We have shown responsible behavior and we uh, still will continue to do so, I think, uh, I, and I hope. Uh, but uh, the Indians are being shown up for what they are doing. You know, look at the uh, international media, the New York Times, Washington Post, the uh, Times of London, Le Mans, uh, Die Welt of Germany, all the Western press, Asai Simbun of Japan, have been now talking about Indian repression in Kashmir, the failure of the Modi government in its economic policies, and the world is now looking at India in a very different light from what it was five years ago. All so right. The, the, the picture is changing. Let's see, sir. I hope peace prevails at the end of the day. This is what matters the most. The world is going through a lot of crisis these days, and God knows once it's over, or when it, whenever it is over, what should be done later, because the economy is going to be the major issue. But anyway, Ambassador Saab, thank you very much for your participation, uh, Dr. Rifat Saab, and also uh, Dr. Maria Sultan. It was a pleasure having you all, and that's all we have for this hour. I'll see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Till then, you take good care. Khuda Hafiz.